well, welcome everybody to the session Early Warning Systems and Climate Resilience. Uh, it's part of the theme Risks and Resilience. And well, let me first introduce myself. My name is uh, Jan Peter van Roek, and I have the pleasure to chair this uh, session. Um, I'm Chief Innovation Officer at Waternet, and I'm also Professor in Drinking Water Engineering at Delft University of Technology. Um, well, we have, I think, a very interesting uh, session with uh, three presentations, and we have one hour, so, well, uh, we can split up the time. Uh, I suggest that each presenter uh, takes about uh, 12 minutes, at maximum 15 minutes, and after that we have a discussion, and the discussion is done through the Q&A button you see on the right side of your screen. So if you uh, have a question, please uh, write it in the Q&A uh, part, and then at the end of each presentation we go through the questions. So no final discussion at the end of the session, but a direct uh, discussion at the end of a presentation. So I hope that is clear, and then we can start with this session. Um, the first presentation uh, is titled Early Warning Systems in the Digital Age, Investigating the Role of Social Media in Disaster Communication in Uttarakhand, India. And we have three presenters for this uh, presentation. That is uh, Aparna Golapudi. Uh, she's part of the communications team at IIHS, that's the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, and her real work involves international, internal and external content management, creating content plans for various projects at IIHS, including those on climate change, water and sanitation, urban agriculture, transportation and more. And Aparna's interests lie at the intersection of communications and integrated water management. And the third the, the second presenter in this specific uh, uh, presentation is Armrut Kiran. Uh, he is a researcher at the Geosp Geospatial Lab at IIHS, and cloud computing, development, and management of spatial data frameworks are his primary research interests. And the third speaker in this presentation is my Rea Kudaganti. Uh, she works as a researcher at the Climate Change team at IIHS, and, and she is also an alumnus from UNESCO IHA Institute for Water Education. And Maitre's work in the least six years focused on climate sciences, vulnerability studies, research management, gender studies, sustainability and research into use. The floor is yours, uh, and uh, well, please, Keep your within the time. Uh, I like to share my screen and start, but um, I think the button is disabled. Is somebody else sharing the screen? Um, I, yeah. I think can somebody check? Uh, or maybe I don't have the permission to share my. Ah, uh, yeah. Now it's okay. Trying. Just a second. Just let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, sure, we can start now. I will take this forward. Um, thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and I'd like to Aparna, thank I think, yeah. the International Water Week for giving us this opportunity. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, as Peter said, our presentation is on early warning Aparna, systems. You're muted. Aparna. No, no. Our presentation up, no? has disappeared for some reason. Amrit, we can hear Aparna. Your pres your screen sharing has stopped. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I but I could Yeah. Sorry for the glitches. Okay, let Let us check uh, in a moment. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm not able to hear her. Is that? We're not able to present uh, on the screen. So, yeah, is it working with the um, with the PowerPoint sharing? No, no I said, I, I'm not able one. to hear up on my end. I uh... I will do yours, okay, and then maybe you can click on it. It might be easier. Okay, um, then. Um... Sorry for that. Um, 
was supposed to see no, after that. Can you all see us now? Yeah. You see my Good. screen now, right? Yes. Now we'll click through it, okay? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. We've lost it again. We lost it. Okay, wait. Right. Sorry for this, guys. Um, it's for us a new system as well. So you can see it now? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. I will get to, like, this was the moderator, the first presentation, and here we have it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and thank you for having us and giving us this opportunity. Our presentation, as you can see, is on early warning systems in the digital age, and we are using the uh, case study of uh, social media, of the use of social media in disaster communications in the state of Uttarakhand in Northern India. Uh, next slide, please. To set the context, um, Uttarakhand is the 27th state in India and is located at the foothills of the Himalayas and is in an ecologically sensitive region. There, the region has experienced a fourfold increase in the frequency of floods and loss of livelihood and over 50,000 acres of uh, forest cover. The region experienced uh, what was termed the Himalayan tsunami in 2013, caused by a breach in a small river in the region. And most recently in April 2021, a glacier burst. Um, and as you can see on the slide, um, the Indian media has extensively covered natural disasters that have affected the region and have tied these up with uh, changing climate and poorly managed development across the area. Next slide, please. Now, um, as we all know, many e-commerce companies use social media as an early warning tool to understand uh, ongoing trends, uh, to gauge audience reaction, even to know what uh, their competitors are doing, and also on the basis of that changing their uh, outreach strategies. But how do we use social media as an early warning system? Uh, I think you can just keep pressing so that the whole slide can be seen. Thank you. Now, while most responses to disasters are reactive and usually happen as the event is taking place, Social media responses are usually proactive. People on, say, for example, Twitter and its sister mobile friendly app, Twitter Lite, proactively use uh, Twitter to communicate with each other and to organize relief efforts in times of crisis. When, uh, for example, the glacier burst happened in Chamoli district in Uttarakhand early this year in April, many locals use social media to alert citizens and authorities sought help and provided real-time updates about it. And in this way, it helped uh, track natural disasters in, na in real time and also alerted first responders to uh, the areas that needed urgent aid. So what can social media platforms do as early warning systems? Platforms such as Facebook and uh, Twitter are the best ways to disseminate disaster-related information to large audiences across the globe, receive support from experts, practitioners, policymakers, researchers, even journalists and scholars, and more importantly, volunteers who can come and help them in time of need. And also important factor in this to help decision makers monitor risks and vulnerability using tools such as Twitter's earthquake detection system or BGS geosocial system or even the photo tagging user generated content on Flickr. And next slide, please. Our research and study has shown that using social media as a tool for disaster support will help the country, uh, in our case, India, uh, set, be, get on the path of achieving the seven targets presented in UNDRR's Sendai framework. I'll hand over to Amrut now. Thank you, Aparna. Um, so for this study, we chose to look at how disasters in Uttarakhand were depicted on uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, 
so if you just press the the uh, a button um, uh, if it's possible yeah so you can see that how we sort of understand how a research question dives into this where our primary question was to sort of explore social media uh, as a key role in early early warning uh, systems uh, for Uttarakhand between our timelines of 2019 and 2021 uh, if you go to the next slide, we can see that uh, why did we actually choose Twitter and Facebook? So, well, Twitter currently has over 22 million active users in India uh, and is known for its quick real-time updates and the potential to be a very massive uh, data library. Uh, especially with its user and location-specific information, it's quite uh, a potential for it to be used in a variety of ways. Uh, if you if you click the button again, we can see Facebook has over 400 million active users. That's the highest in the world right now. And uh, also the largest community support and, and a higher market reach and user friendliness. Uh, when we compare the overall, you know, the user interaction between these two platforms, we see that Facebook reigns supreme in the potential of the largest available uh, crowdsourced data. Uh, and in India, we can see that the internet penetration social media usage is over 50% uh, in, of its population. Uh, that's expected to peak by over 900 million by 2025. So we'll, keeping this in mind, let's just check out how our data pipeline was, uh, was for the study. Uh, over to the next slide, please. Uh, we frame the data pipeline in a way to sort of uh, accentuate the search filter and tag mechanism. That basically means that we can search a lot of these keywords uh, using Twitter's publicly available API. Uh, and also with a lot of custom scripting in you know Python or R, uh, and also a couple of other third-party tools, we can sort of put it into the organic filtering stage. Uh, that's the next uh, stage on this one, where basically we can sort of coerce into the different timelines that we like to identify. That is the different sentiments and the different themes that can come out of these tweets, uh, which is then again visualized in the next segment of this uh, of this slide. That is where we see the reach, the impression, and the interactions that are these keywords basically in, in the social media content. Uh, that basically means how far somebody's tweet has gone or uh, in terms of the uh, you know the user space and how many people have interacted with it or have they seen these tweets and posts on their devices. Uh, so when we talk about these three phases, then we literally jump into the actual, you know, the feature, the feature list of these two uh, platforms, where in the next slide we'll see what are the different crisis. Uh, response features basically. Uh, so during times of crisis or emergencies, Twitter and Facebook have very different features uh, that let us that let a user know what's happening. So Twitter on one hand shows you tweets in real time uh, that is live feed on exactly a on a second by second basis of if anything is happening, as well as a continuous news feed that is sort of based on your location. So even uh, minor uh, events around your location will also start popping up around you on your app, right? Uh, but Facebook, on the other hand, is a more community-oriented tool. That means it is literally famous for the marking safe feature that is uh, it, it has sort of innovated under. So that basically means that it lets your connections uh, know uh, you're safe in case you are in, in the area of crisis. Uh, but in the unfortunate case of being unsafe, uh, Facebook also provides your support uh, you know, by giving you information in terms of the different organizations, relief and aid that is available in your vicinity. Uh, but also people and organizations can start like different pages, you know, raise money, get more information around you and all of that community support, which Facebook is known for. So, yeah, the next slide. Um, so what have we actually understood from this study? So it, we are still in our, in our nascent stage, of course, but uh, from the massive data dump that we have uh, from Twitter and Facebook, uh, there is a, a lot of amount of consecutive cleaning analysis and tagging that is required. Uh, we see that the majority of these posts uh, are on situational overview. Uh, you know, people, agencies, organizations uh, reporting from the field about, you know, the dead and the affected, the displaced and all the evacuation efforts and relief uh, that is usually seen in all of these events. Uh, again, in, in the next slide, we'll see that uh, with more detailed filtering, we can actually, you know, dive down deeper into the different keywords and hashtags that sort of give out the sentiment analysis, basically, that shows that not only with factual data points that we have, we can also see how it is in terms of people's reaction. Uh, you know, if people are talking about, you know, how they lost their homes or their loved ones, or if the, you know, the patriotic side of the tweet that we see in India often is the how the National Defense, uh, the National Disaster Response Force or the Army, and how they support in the evacuation efforts and how they protect and serve us also, not only from the borders, but also within our borders. So uh, using this sort of information, we also try to quantify this. So in the next slide, if you would see that we're trying to take two different uh, hashtags as a sample study. 
and these two hashtags uttarakhand is a state so uttarakhand rains and uttarakhand floods these two have been quite commonly used for over the last couple of years where you've seen that the reach of these two uh, tweets have expanded over like 200000 to 260000 reach and impressions for uttarakhand range uh, rains and also over 1.2 million uh, reach and impressions for uttarakhand floods Uh, this basically shows us that it's a very good example of how the potential outreach that a social media tweet or a post can provide if used effectively and if tracked and you know analyzed properly over time. Uh, not to mention that this is a clear uh, size of this uh, almost a potentially untapped data source uh, that also from a perspective of just being a massive data lake, but also in a geospatial uh, perspective of having location information from the field from millions of people across the country is quite a big crowd source data. um so but also with this we see in the next slide that uh, these platforms although used across uh, multiple you know multiple generations of people even for that matter if you can go to the next slide please uh, that these platforms are also quite different uh, in terms of their features right so uh, the aforementioned features uh, also work in real time and like in twitter and then you can mark yourself safe and these are like sort of the major differences but uh, twitter on the other hand has very direct engagement of users and the live and trending features are the most commonly used ones uh, but and also with the hashtags you can literally amplify a tweet that's how a single tweet or a post about a disaster event in uttarakhand reaches up to 1 2 million you know uh, views uh and that's a common way to amplify that but on the other hand facebook uh, on its you know marking yourself uh, safe features and all of this and a community oriented platform uh they have a lot of these groups and pages through which you can you know percolate a lot of this information but uh, we have seen over time that facebook has reduced uh, its traffic over you know the last couple of years because of the privacy issues and all of that but the the new insight that we can gain is that now facebook sort of has changed uh their name to meta so we are yet to see what sort of insights can we gain from you know the users inclination on how this can actually change uh in terms of how much data can it be provided to us or you know how is going to change their interaction on social media per se uh but yeah so with this i would like to hand it over to uh, my three uh thanks so much amrit uh, can you hear me uh great thanks so much amrit uh, to to really conclude where we started off so we started off with the question of really understanding does social media play a role in early warning messages for disasters in uttarakhand so through series of tweets and post analysis as 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 aparna and amrit explained i think we can significantly conclude that social media does play a very important and often a critical role in in providing a bunch of things that we've identified through our study uh so the first one is providing a situational overview and this is in terms of the number of people who are dead who are injured who are being evacuated who need to be evacuated and for whom relief needs to be sent or is either sent uh the second is calling for a humanitarian response and this is typically in the terms of calls for food water resources uh travel and access to very basic resources such as sanitation services right the third bit that we identified as funding now this is very critical in terms of the money and the donations that we need towards disaster relief and response uh could you tap one more uh, one more time please uh and the fourth one is a general coordination like how amrit explained it's also important that there is a coordination within uh within communities within rescue groups and also within the disaster management agencies and social media does that very easily for people to get this kind of coordination and information and uh, in addition to all of this the growing use of social media itself such as twitter facebook that we have analyzed and something beyond that such as instagram flickr all of these platforms especially in a low and a middle income country like india they certainly have a they have an opportunity not just to provide information but also to help in quick decision making so the amount of data that comes the amount of numbers that come they're sort of an indication for the agencies to really make that decision fast and send relief send uh, these evacuation teams to 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 the site so it certainly helps in a faster decision making capacity of agencies uh could we go to the next slide please uh but having said that i think uh, while we were doing this study and also while gathering the kind of data we have the use of social media itself has a lot of limitations and some of that but that we'd like to highlight and that we faced ourselves during the study uh the first one is having access which is access to network services but also access to the knowledge of using these apps 
Now, in, in a country like India, where I think Amrit highlighted 50% of people are on social media. So there is a 50% of population that's perhaps not aware of uh, of of these uh, aware of uh, using these apps but also having access to these apps you know the kind of phones that they have they're not really smartphones very basic phones so access becomes a very big problem to gather this kind of information and the second is the accuracy of the information now i think off late uh, social media is becoming a place where fake news circulates a lot but also there's a lot of sensationalization of these numbers how many are dead how many are really dead how many are really being evacuated i think sometimes there is a certain uh, problem with getting those numbers uh, so it takes a while for us to identify which kind of information is accurate and we say this also especially in terms of funding so sometimes there are bank account numbers which are put in the name of relief so we might think we are contributing towards a relief, but perhaps it's somebody extorting money from us in the name of relief. So we've seen examples of these kinds. So the accuracy of the information is, is again a very big limitation for us while we are getting this kind of information. And the third one, as, as Amrit had earlier mentioned, is the use of Facebook itself has come down. And one of the biggest reasons for this are these privacy features. I think even Twitter has a privacy feature. You can lock your profiles. Now, when you lock your profiles, uh, sometimes during emergency, the, 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 the level of circulation sort of comes down. The, the, it happens only within friends. It does not go beyond that. Uh, so then there is a problem with disseminating that kind of information to a wider audience. But amidst all these limitations, I think what we'd like to conclude by saying is that promoting an increase in social media users, which is both across the rural and the urban spectrum, it certainly provides a key opportunity to make use of these social media technologies, not just as a part of communication system, but also as a part of early warning systems during disaster management. Uh, so I think we'd like to very briefly conclude there. There's a lot we've done, but this is how much we can do it at this point of time. So if there's any questions, feel free to ask us or write to us. I think our email IDs are there. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation, uh, you all three. Um, I don't know whether there are questions in the question and answering. At least I see one question. Can you also see it? Maybe I uh, read it. That is uh, the question, do you need a backup eh? during a disaster? Uh, communication can be out of service, no electricity, uh, failure, a breakdown of the system. So uh, how um, reliable is it and do you need a backup for, yeah. for this? So, thank you. So, uh, so there are multiple ways to look at this. So what we initially thought of was to have uh, multiple GIS layers of network connectivity, uh, you know, mapped out basically to understand how far uh, is network connectivity in, in all the spectrums, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G, hopefully upcoming, can be mapped out in all of these, you know, uh, areas of risk. Uh, and so through that, we'll be able to see how good is the network commu uh, you know, communication overall throughout the year. And then at during times of crisis, we'll be able to sort of estimate, uh, you know, if specific regions of, you know, where the disaster has occurred, if the network goes down. So, but usually what have, what has happened is uh, people uh, off the field tend to get more information and then sort of spread it out instead of people who are actually affected. So if mm -hmm. I were to be affected in a flood, uh, I wouldn't be posting it on Twitter right now because my priority isn't that. Uh, but people outside of that area would be on field and, you know, would have any other source of communication. They are the ones like news agencies and journalists so they tend to put out more of these tweets that are highlighted and actually from our study we see that the the most retweets and the handles are coming from local news agencies uh, the regional news agencies that are not you know national so the local uh, channels so they tend to put out a lot of these posts more uh, so but using this data for us is uh, you know uh, pri you know uh, primary anyway because all of this is available and but uh, one another other limitation that uh, we forgot to mention is that uh, twitter itself has a core limitation in terms of how much data you can pull out uh, they have a limitation in terms of you know per day you can get like around 100 or 200 tweets and things like that uh, so an, an open source openly available crowdsource data is yet to be fully you know taken potential of uh, but yeah, backups, I guess, in terms of you know, just basic mapping is the only way to sort of go forward to sort of resolve that issue. Uh, but definitely a limitation that we have to look into. But thank you for that question. Yes. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, I'm looking at the time. There's time for one short question and one short answer. Somebody want to pose a question? No, I don't see a question and I don't 
hear anyone. So once again, thank you very much for this nice presentation. And I suggest that we move on to the next uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And the next presentation is titled Unveiling the Seasonal Inundation Dynamics and Water Balance of the Mara Wetland, Tanzania, Tanzania through multi-temporal random forests classification of Sentinel to satellite imagery. And the presentation will be given by um, Judith Cole. And she currently works as a water research engineer and field special analyst at the Weather Makers. And her works, work involves the use of geospatial data to analyze the dynamic behavior of natural ecosystems and develop nature-based engineering solutions to regenerate degraded or disrupted systems. Juliette, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, share my screen. Let's see if it works. Um, uh, let's see. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone. Thank you, Jan Peter. Um, so as you, as you said, the title of my research is Unveiling the Seasonal Inundation Dynamics of the Mar Wetland in Tanzania through Multi-Temporal Random Forest Classification of Sentinel-2 Satellite Imagery. So that's quite a mouthful, but um, in more simple terms, I use satellite imagery to understand the hydrology of a system. And my co-authors are listed here, uh, Steph Lermit, Marcus Shrakovic, Francesco Bregoli, and Michael McLean. So a quick outline of the presentation. I will provide some background information, go through the methods, uh, present my results and a quick uh, discussion and conclusion and end with some final recommendations for the um, Mara region. So first some important background information. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term wetland, um, this image is uh, taken by Francesco Bregoli in 2017 and is uh, taken in the Mara wetland. Um, and in general, these are systems that are on the um, boundary between terrestrial and aquatic environments. Um, and they can take, a, a, take in many forms. So it can be a mangrove or like this, the papyrus vegetation is mixing with water. Um, and these uh, ecosystems are very important for the world. Um, they provide local uh, benefits uh, such as habitats and resources, but also in a global sense for carbon storage. But they are also very uh, vulnerable. They rely on a seasonal water availability. So um, the seasonal water availability often controls the ecological cycles and drives the functioning of the ecosystem. And human intervention, which can be in the form of dam construction, a climate change or deforestation, for example, can disrupt these systems and um, take them out of balance. And this has led to a loss of 70% since uh, 1900, estimated by the UN. And um, so that's a very important uh, point, and that's also why it's a topic of research uh, today. Then for those unfamiliar with remote sensing, um, so a satellite orbits the Earth and captures information from the land surface uh, in the form of a satellite image. And each satellite image, the pixels uh, contain a very valuable information from the land cover, which can be analyzed uh, for a number of uh, different uh, yeah, reasons or applications. And um, so moving on to my particular uh, research area, on the top left, you can see the continent of Africa and the location of the research, uh, which is on the uh, east end of Lake Victoria on the border between Kenya and Tanzania. So you can see in blue the uh, Lake Victoria and bright green is the Mara River Basin. And then the dark blue is the Mara River and outlined in red is the specific research area, which is the Mara wetland. So the hydrology of this system is illustrated by the sketch. Uh, on the top right, the dark green represents the Mara forest 
uh, sorry, the Mao Forest, and that's where the Mara River originates. So as it uh, goes uh, to the west, it um, meanders through the Serengeti and through some agricultural lands. And eventually, um, as the topography flattens, it spreads out into a large papyrus swamp. Papyrus is a very dominant vegetation there, very dense uh, aquatic vegetation. And uh, the water spreads out and uh, the vegetation is important in purifying the water before it um, continues down and discharges into Lake Victoria on the west. And this sketch here is a particular snapshot of the system in a, a specific moment in time. But as I said, there's a seasonality in much uh, of the um, worldwide uh, wetlands. And um, so an increase in rainfall, for example, seasonally, or uh, an increase in discharge, more groundwater, results in a different yeah, inundation extent of the wetland. So you can see here the uh, floodplain uh, spreads out, there's more vegetation growth, there's more water. And this is exactly what I've been researching um, for this uh, paper, is how does the wetland behave in space and time, the inundation, and what are the water sources for the seasonal expansion? Knowing this um, is important for the management of these systems to know which uh, water balance components are important to control in order to keep these systems uh, in their own um, natural ecological balance. So that brings me to my methods. How, um, how is this done? Which is divided in two phases. The first phase of which I've mapped the spatial and temporal dynamics of the inundation of the Mara wetland using satellite imagery. And then in the second phase um, is more of a quantification of these um, water balance components. So each of these flows, including precipitation, discharge and evapotranspiration in order to estimate the seasonal water balance of the wetland. So an important um, resource firm has been Google Earth Engine a Code Editor, which is a, a cloud-based geospatial processing platform, which looks like this, um, in which I've loaded the satellite imagery and wrote, written the algorithms that um, are necessary to um, map this area. And uh, yeah, an important concept to understand for those unfamiliar with uh, different uh, image processing techniques is land cover classification. So here's a, uh, an example of a satellite image of the Mara wetland. And um, let's say in very simple terms, uh, it's composed of uh, dry uh, land, some dense papyrus vegetation, and let's say some flooded uh, um, areas. Now, if we want to know for the rest of the image, which of the land covers um, or the yeah, spatial um, uh, pattern of the land covers, we can apply an algorithm to recognize um, each of the uh, areas and map the rest of the region. So keeping this in mind, um, which has been the basis of the research, um, the methods I've used is first of all to load 73 images um, between 2017 and the end of 2019 um, from Sentinel-2 data, or Sentinel, yeah, Sentinel-2 data, sorry. And um, I've applied such an algorithm, land cover classification algorithm, to each of these images to distinguish between wetland and dry land uh, for all, which results in a, a chart, um, a time series chart of wetland area, which is later used to analyze um, the water balance. And so adding the um, different hydrological components such as um, discharge precipitation and evapotranspiration, I've derived a water balance of the area. So moving on uh, to the results, this presents the most important result from phase one. So here you can see on the y-axis the area in square kilometers and the x-axis time. And each of the colors in the chart represents one land cover. So um, the flooded inundation classes include flooded vegetation in the main swamp, open water, flooded vegetation outside of the main swamp, 
and lightly vegetated floodplain. So if we look at the green and blue classes, we can see a clear pattern, a bimodal pattern, meaning two peaks in a year, of the wetland changing, um, of the dynamics of the wetland in space and time. Now, this shows a temporal um, pattern, but to show you the spatial pattern, these two black lines represent uh, the next images I show, the timing. So the first uh, top image shows a dry season situation and the bottom shows a wet season situation. So at the top, you can see a clear uh, outline of the papyrus swamp, the wetted area, and a dry floodplain um, on the eastern end. And as we transition through the year, this changes with different uh, increases in water availability to the wetland. And there's a large expansion on the eastern end, more emergent uh, vegetation, some open water areas. Um, so the, that shows the spatial um, sort of uh, pattern in, of the wetland as it changes in time. Now, for the phase two, which is quantifying the water balance, uh, this chart shows on the y-axis the water volume in cubic meters and on the x again time. And a similar bimodal pattern uh, can be seen. So there's peaks occurring at different times in the year, not just one um, straight line. And um, what is noteworthy is that the precipitation for most of the year, um, so each of the bars represents a different uh, water balance component. So uh, cumulative discharge inflow is blue, um, green is precipitation, cumulative evapotranspiration is gray and black then discharge outflow. So if we look at the height of the bars, we can see for most of the year, the green bars are uh, larger than the blue, meaning precipitation amount is um, more for most of the year, except for in these peak moments where discharge is very high and leads to a lot of open water flooding. Now, some important discussion and conclusion points um, from the research were that local precipitation plays a very uh, important role for the source water of the seasonal expansion. So the bimodal regime that can be seen in the uh, pattern of the inundation is also the bimodal regime shown by the uh, precipitation, which is a rather slow process of um, vegetation growth and a slow increase in water availability to the wetland and its resources. And um, the Mara River, rather than showing the same bimodal regime, it has a rather steady base flow and some peak inundation moments. And um, these peak moments, yeah, they cause flooding beyond the main swamp and is a rather fast process of quick flooding. And also the water also leaves, seems to leave quite quickly as well. So goes to the groundwater. And Lake Victoria then, uh, the backwater of Lake Victoria um, and the base flow of the Mar River sustain the main permanent swamp. So with this, we can uh, conclude that the Mara River is very important in the dry season when there's less rainfall and it provides for the main swamp. So you can imagine that in situations where, um, where there's a lot of uh, water demand in the dry season, this could be a critical um, moment for the wetland um, and yeah, in need of management. Um, and this brings me to my recommendations uh, for the Mara wetland. So with the first conclusion that local precipitation plays an important role is to quantify the implications under various climate change scenarios, um, to know what the effects might be for um, of an increase in precipitation or a decrease or higher temperature um, could also um, have an effect. Then the second point that Mara wetland, um, sorry, Mara river base flow is important during the dry season is a critical point since the dry season is also when dam operations um, are important for irrigation and uh, the water demand from the human side is the most. But um, water resource allocation strategies and the dam operations should 
be attuned also to meet the environmental requirements for the Mara wetland. And last point, um, the ecological importance of the large flood events of the Mara River um, should also be analyzed um, on, in an ecological sense because dam operations might sort of diminish the peaks and um, maybe these peaks are very necessary for um, the primary production in the system. Uh, yeah, so this brings me to the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, please uh, let me know. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Juliet, for the nice presentation. Very interesting uh, what you can do with uh, satellite imagery. Uh, I see there uh, one question from Amrut Kiran. Uh, his question is, how do you deal with gaps in the satellite imagery? Are all the tiles available for 2017, 2019, or do you have to do some sort of data harmonization with other sensors? Yeah, thank you uh, very much for your question. And I think that's one of the um, major, not problems, but major challenges in using remote sensing is that there's the limit of your spatial resolution, but also the limit of your temporal resolution. So having um, maybe 10 images a year um, forces you to make some assumptions about what happens in between. And uh, for my research specifically, I've used uh, optical imagery, which means there is cloud interference. So there are instances which um, yeah, can contain cloud, yeah, acquisition dates where there's a cloud in the way and uh, makes the images unusable. And um, yeah, so it, data harmonization um, was in this sense in the form of making assumptions what happens in between and making sure the data that is there um, represents the land cover rather than the atmosphere. Um, and I haven't mixed with other sensors, but an idea is to, um, and I think if, if this research is continued, um, in order to make more specific interpretations of the results, it, it would be necessary uh, to include Sentinel-1 data, for example, to have radar, um, which does not uh, have the problem of clouds and uh, which could yeah increase the temporal resolution of the uh, uh of the scenes um yeah so thank you very much for your question uh, i hope that answers uh answers it okay thank you very much um i do not see other questions in the question and answering uh so i suggest we go to the next uh, speaker next presentation Gillette, once again thank you very much thank you uh, the next presentation is titled Building a Climate Resilient Strategy for Lower Manhattan in a Post-COVID Landscape. Uh, there are three authors, uh, Roni Deitz, uh, John Batten III, and Elia Hutchinson. Two of them are with us. Um, first, Roni Deitz is uh, present with us, and she leads Arcadis North American uh, Urban and Community Resilience Planning Practice. And her experience has been shaped by managing and delivering large multidisciplinary resilience projects, including the financial district and seaport climate resilience master plan. At the core of Roni's project work is her ability to build consensus among a variety I'm of stakeholders, engage diverse communities and bridge the engineering and planning disciplines. And also with us is John Batten. Uh, he is the global cities director for Arcadis, leading a global team of city executives who are dedicated to delivering smart and sustainable urban outcomes, which improves a city's competitiveness and quality of life. And John is a global recognized thought leader in cities, water, and has more than three decades of experience in the field. So the floor is yours. Go ahead. Wonderful. Can you see my screen? Yeah, sure. It's visible. Okay, great. So, well, thank you for that introduction. I'm Ronnie Dietz, project manager for the Financial District and Seaport Climate Resilience Master Plan. And along with my colleague, John, we're excited to take you through our work on building a resilient lower Manhattan. So to kick us off, I want to share a little bit of the backstory and context as to how this master plan came to be. So today we are focused on Lower Manhattan in New York City in the United States. Um, and a portion of our study area is shown on this map here. Hurricane Sandy, which made landfall in October of 2012, exposed many of Lower Manhattan's 
uh, vulnerabilities to climate change, whether it was coastal storms or thinking towards the future as to how sea level rise or extreme precipitation could impact the city. And over the last decade, New York City has committed almost a billion dollars in climate adaptation projects supporting Lower Manhattan. However, the financial district and seaport, which is the area shown in blue with the blue dotted line, is a truly complex area. It's highly constrained portion of the shoreline, um, and it's been quite challenging to site coastal defense here. Uh, as a result, the city was looking at potentially extending the shoreline in order to place new land to site the coastal defense and kicked off this master plan and this team to help address that issue. So this master plan is filling that missing link and ultimately completing the puzzle uh, for Lower Manhattan coastal resiliency. So the Comprehensive Resilience Plan uh, is a two-year study. It began in October of 2019 and it'll wrap up later this year with a final report. Um, and a little bit about the project goals are shown on this slide. Uh, we will take you through the first one, which is the development of the conceptual design for coastal defense infrastructure, as well as talk a bit about the drainage strategy. Um, one of the other key deliverables is an implementation roadmap that focuses on financing, construction, and also identifying a pathway for permitting and approvals. Um, it's important to note that in the United States, it's quite challenging to reclaim land and extend a shoreline. So we've been working quite closely with a variety of regulatory agencies to identify that pathway and ensure that this project can move forward. And then just lastly, our project team. So Arcadis is the lead engineering firm and we're working closely with the city, uh, specifically the New York City Economic Development Corporation and then the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. And this is really an interdisciplinary team of experts. Um, we are supported by two wonderful uh, landscape architects and urban designers, one and skate. So what are the risks that Lower Manhattan faces and why do we need coastal resilience infrastructure? So climate change is around us. We can all feel it. it it's here. And for Lower Manhattan, that means that we are seeing an increase in daily tidal flooding, bringing higher water levels to low-lying areas. Uh, we're seeing coastal storms increasing and bringing surge to our front doors. And extreme precipitation is becoming more and more frequent, um, impacting and stressing our sewer systems, also flooding our streets. And protecting Lower Manhattan is more than just protecting Lower Manhattan. Here in New York, Lower Manhattan is a hub. It's where our subway lines pass through. It's the mecca of where our path riders and subway users and the transportation grid comes together. And it's home to numerous jobs. So over 10% of all jobs in New York City are located in Lower Manhattan. So this has a significant impact on the annual GDP, uh, representing 8% of the overall city's total. So to protect Lower Manhattan, we're designing towards two different climate risks. So the first is the blue, which is the 100-year floodplain, or the storm that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. And because of the time span of this master plan, we're designing out to 2100. We're also designing to the 2100 high tide line, or the event that could flood daily Lower Manhattan by two to three blocks. And the reason that both of these floodplains are so large is because not only is the area low lying, roughly two meters above sea level, but it creates a bowl. So once water goes over the shoreline, it moves further inland, uh, moving its way to lower elevation. Uh, so the area is quite at risk from both of these two uh, different factors. And our challenge is that there's really limited space available on land to site this coastal defense. Uh, so a picture of the study area is shown on the screen, highlighted in the, the yellow dotted line. And this area is home to numerous ferry terminals, which are shown in the bottom of the screen. Working your way up, there's an important heliport. There's numerous piers for economic development. And there's also an elevated highway that runs through the study area, which is directly on top of the bulkhead line, making it quite challenging to site coastal defense. So how do we do it? How do we build our coastal defense without walling off the city? And while constructing that wall along the existing bulkhead would provide flood protection, it would disconnect users, New Yorkers, visitors from all of those assets that exist along the waterfront today. So it would not meet the project goals. 
It also would create an unsafe condition. As I noted that there's the elevated highway and putting a wall directly adjacent would create poorly lit corridors and also unhealthy air quality. We've also learned from extensive hydrodynamic modeling that this area has larger waves given its position in the New York Harbor. And when you take those large waves as well as the lower ground elevations, it makes deployable measures like gates less suitable for our project area. So we're looking at a range of passive measures or measures that are in place at all times, like flood walls, levees, dikes, in order to protect lower Manhattan. So to achieve our project goals, we are proposing to extend the shoreline of lower Manhattan. This will provide us with the necessary space to site our coastal defense while maintaining the access to the water that is so important to access those functions that exist along the waterfront today. This new space also creates opportunities to accomplish other project goals, whether it's siting drainage infrastructure that's needed to manage water behind the line of defense, capturing stormwater runoff before it enters the sewer system, and also replacing any existing open space that would be displaced through the creation of this project. And then lastly, at the water's edge, we need to be able to plan for both the current and future maritime uses, acknowledging that these assets are low lying that they're vulnerable to sea level rise and storms, but they must be resilient and able to function as we move forward, given their critical role that they play for the city. And now I'll pass it to John to talk about how we seize this moment to reimagine a 21st century waterfront. Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, so the next uh, 10 slides are sort of previews of the concepts that we've developed uh, for the master plan. And, and, um, and, and as Ronnie says, it's about a combination of uh, keeping the water out of lower Manhattan, but also reconnecting the shoreline uh, to the amenities of the, of the waterfront uh, that have been obscured over time. So Ronnie, if you can go to the next slide, we'll kind of begin to show them the uh, various drawings that kind of give us sense. So here is the flood defense. We'll use three types or two types, caissons and walls and bridges and gates. So your traditional flood defense infrastructure will be uh, deployed. Next. We will also uh, have an in, uh, interior drainage uh, inside of the, uh, of the lower Manhattan, as Ronnie says, the water, once it, once it breaches the wall, tends to find low spots within the, uh, the canyons of Lower Manhattan, and we will have to address that with pump stations and other uh, infrastructure. There's some existing uh, um, infrastructure, but there's, as Ronnie says, there's ferry terminals, there's piers, there's other kinds of activities and this is a major transportation hub so we're going to have to be very flexible in how we design for that part of the island um and there are a lot of pedestrians a lot of people a lot of bikes and e equipment and emergency vehicles and and different pathways it's one of the oldest parts of the city of manhattan it's the, it includes the original Dutch settlement uh, uh, infrastructure, so that not all the roads are in your classic New York style grid, but some of them are. So it's a combination of pathways and all kinds of uses going on down there. Next. And then there's, uh, you know, there's bicycle circulation uh, in, this, in this space as well, as well as parks as well as uh, uh, you know, the amenities of a riverfront that city dwellers like to enjoy. Uh, and biking is really uh, increasingly a major uh, priority in the city of New York, and we have to account for it as well. And um, we have to be able to assure maintenance and uh, accessibility and, and navigation on the waterways as we build out uh, this defense. So um, it has to be uh, a program that accommodates the city living and breathing and reacting uh, to uh, events, which happens all the time in New York City. So uh, we really have to keep that in play and keep and support it. Next. 
And then we have a, a lot of ecological considerations to uh, to sustain in in the um, in the river basin. Uh, it's tidal. It uh, there's lots of living creatures down there. The you know the no longer are we producing oysters in Lower Manhattan, although there is a vision that we will be able to in the future. But we have to protect and preserve the, uh, you know, the flora and fauna of Lower Manhattan as we do this project. And lastly, um, you know, the, the, we want to not only in, in, improve the, the resilience and fortification of Lower Manhattan, but we really want to uh, build upon that and enhance with floating habitats, return of oyster uh, farming, uh, have some wave screens, have some amenities that allow for recreational use of the waters of lower Manhattan. So that gives you sort of a sense of the, uh, the various concerns, the various uh, elements of the project that we are incorporating and being mindful of. So I pass it over to you, Ronnie. Thank you, John. <clears throat> so then the last theme is about our project protecting and enhancing the public waterfront experience. So as John mentioned, this is an active, vibrant community. And what we're doing is preserving and restoring what people love about the waterfront today. So we've done extensive stakeholder engagement. We've heard love and passion for the waterfront esplanade, for different spaces, for the ability to get down to the waterfront and maintaining this as we look to transform the shoreline. There's also opportunities to create new experiences, most notably an upper level um, as we site this coastal defense, which will be a few meters above the shoreline. It creates new views of the East River. And then lastly, also spaces for new types of indoor and outdoor program, whether it's playgrounds or community buildings, uh, this is an opportunity to create new program that better serves the community as well as all of Lower Manhattan. And this is the vision of the master plan. So shown um, outboard of the elevated highway, I unfortunately don't have a cursor, is the, the master plan uh, recreated and uh, integrated into the fabric of Lower Manhattan, creating new and inviting and exciting spaces and I'll leave you with one rendering um, for those who have been down to the Wall Street area. This is what the new waterfront we are proposing will look like. And with that, I will pass it back to our moderator. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, both uh, for the very interesting uh, presentation. Well, it's, it's a challenge how to deal with all those functions and, uh, well, uh, complex infrastructure, maybe even conflicting uh, infrastructures. Uh, um, I see uh, a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, how was the involvement of the community during the planning of the project? Yes, so stakeholder engagement was quite core and central um, as we recognize that this project will take decades to implement and it's really about building a coalition of support. Um, so it was interesting knowing that the COVID-19 pandemic occurred in the midst of our project, um, which encouraged us to create an online portal. Um, I'd be happy to drop the link in. So it's fideiceportclimate at .nyc. Um, and it's really given us an opportunity to co-create with the community. We want to hear from them what's most important, what their priorities are, and ensure that we're bringing our technical findings to them and they're bringing their needs and desires back to us. So we create a vision together for Lower Manhattan. Okay, thank you. Clear. Um, then I see a question from Edwin Ross. Uh, he asked, has there been any consideration to controlling the Upper Bay as a whole, rather than the more local coastal sections of Manhattan? What were the considerations there? Yes, early on after Sandy, there were a couple of studies that looked at storm surge barriers out in the New York Harbor. Um, and ultimately there were a couple of key findings. So the first is that the area itself is very low lying. So while the surge barriers uh, would pr protect the region during coastal storms, it would leave the area still quite vulnerable to daily sea level rise and tidal flooding. Um, so that's a challenge. And <clears throat> in addition, the hydrodynamics of the New York Bay are quite uh, atypical. Um, so the East River is actually a tidal strait. Uh, water moves in and out in different directions at different times of the day. Um, which also makes this quite challenging to cite, uh, say, more holistic upper bay solutions. 
Um, and then the last piece is that the tiebacks for these larger infrastructure measures would be quite long because the areas as you work your way further out um, are also quite low lying. So it would have a tremendous impact on the communities uh, that exist further out in the New York Harbor. Okay, thanks. And I see, well, we've time for one uh, final question, uh, I think. Uh, that's question, the predictions of sea level rise change yearly. Uh, well, I, I looked at the Netherlands uh, recently and new predictions were there. It goes from one meter to 1.5 meter. So, well, probably in your project, you also have to deal with that. How do you cope with that? What's the time horizon of your project? It's a great question. So we are looking out to 2100. Um, and New York City has the New York City Panel on Climate Change. Um, so it is a panel of research and academic experts across the area that take a look at the IPCC data, but also bring it to a localized level to understand what will happen in New York City. Uh, we are using a conservative, uh, it's 90th percentile estimate for 2100. Um, it's 75 inches. I apologize that I don't know the, the conversion to centimeters, um, but it's a couple of meters of sea level rise. Um, again, quite conservative, but it's certainly not the most extreme as to what could possibly happen by end of the century. Okay, thank you. Well, looking at the time, I think, uh, well, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, and I think we have come to an end of this session. Uh, we heard three, well, very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I think they uh, perfectly fit in the theme of uh, uh, our uh, uh, International Water uh, Week. So I would like to thank all the speakers and I hope to see you in uh, one of the next sessions, either uh, online, today and tomorrow, either uh, in person, Wednesday, Thursday or Friday. So thanks for your attendance, also uh, the speakers and the uh, attendances. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>